David Hocker, and we're here at the Morgantown Company Presbyterian Church. We invite you to tune in uh, on YouTube every Monday morning uh, or later, and uh, as we worship together, we believe in the Word of God, as the Word of God, and we will be preaching from the Word of God. Our other gospel scripture today is found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. May God bring forth blessings and fruit from the reading of his precious word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we come before you this day and like every Sunday, we celebrate Easter. We celebrate the risen Lord. We celebrate that you came to seek and to save that which was lost. And glory to your name. We put our earthly calendar on with it, but it's your time. It's your timetable. We know it was about the time of the Passover and that these things came about. And there was a big crowd. It wasn't a small crowd. It wasn't a little gospel beating. It was a big crowd that was in Jerusalem. And they heard and they saw about Jesus the Son of God. Lord, we thank you for, in the fullness of time, coming to save us from our sins. And we pray, Lord, for each of us, individually, that you might forgive us our sins. We pray for our families, that their sins might be forgiven. Father, we pray for the people in our community, that their sins might be forgiven. Yea, Lord, we pray for people in the United States, because they need saving too. And Lord, even this whole world, your word says that you love the whole world and gave yourself for it. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of life, this wonderful planet that uh, we have crea that's created for us, especially for us. And we thank you for that. And so it is, Father, we lift up these that are on our prayer list. Lord, we know there's some prayers that are being said and need to be said that are kept quiet. But Holy Spirit, we agree with them now that thy will be done. Father God, we thank you for all those that have come before us here proclaiming the gospel message, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. Let us, as we remember today, let us remember to say, Jesus is Lord. He is risen. He is risen indeed. All right, now. Everybody awake? Okay. All right, now. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. All right. Uh, 
a couple of Presbyterians, like the Methodists and the Baptists uh, and some others, are a Protestant church. And part of being a Protestant church is we believe in the priesthood of the believer. We believe that each one of us has the right to read God's Word for ourselves and that the Holy Spirit will help us interpreting it. Okay? Now, that's not only a right. Carter and the Scouts, I don't know whether they've come to it yet or not, but one of the things that they teach you is rights and then responsibilities because you have the rights for certain things but you also have the responsibility to do your part of it and so uh, it is with us as we serve the Lord we are given rights to read the Bible for ourselves but we're responsible and to ask the Holy Spirit to help us interpret it and that's an important thing. The stories, uh, and if we do a thorough examination of the resurrection of Jesus in the summer, uh, like I plan to, we're going to uh, talk about how all of the things come and put together, and you look at the whole, the whole thing. Because it tells one thing after another. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are all written within 15 or 20 years of each other, right? <clears throat> and they all pretty much follow the same basic outline. But John is different. His was, if I remember correctly, about 35 or 40 years later. It was okay that John would be the one to do this because he was the youngest among them, right? He was the youngest disciple. He was the one that Jesus loved, is how he referred to himself. And it says in the Gospel of John, it's not known as a, this is a word, synoptic. In other words, in sequence. John says that this book was written that we might believe, and by believing we may have life in his name. Am I right? That's true. So, uh, if you ever been somewhere and gone on vacation or a trip with somebody and uh, you sat down and were recounting it later and somebody that's got a good memory uh, will say, well, don't you remember this? Do you remember the restaurant we ate at? Where the waitress spilled the coffee all over daddy? And they might not have mentioned that, but that did that mean that the stories that you all have told around the table are untrue? No. It's not. It's just another revelation. And God wants us to know about Jesus the Christ. We've seen Jesus. We've seen the Father. So that is an important thing. Now, my wife tells me, she said, David, you start out and you spread a wide loop and said, if we hang on, you'll get around and tie it all together. Uh, what I'm trying to express is that things that happened happened in a certain way in order to adhere to the laws and to show that the laws were adhered to uh, as they did things. What was the rules about something being established by witnesses? Anybody remember? 
that everything be established by what? Two or three witnesses. Okay? Now, who could be witnesses? That gets to hang up. Because you see, uh, Christ spread the uh, canopy open to include all that would call on the name of the Lord. And he made it very clear that women were included. But at the time that this happened, that we're reading about here in Colossians, Women couldn't testify. And so it was, an, even though the women, like usual, got up, was early doing the work, and got out and getting things done, the men had to see it so they could testify in court so that the laws at that time would be adhered to. Jesus said, he said, I didn't come to break the law. I came to do what? Fulfill the law. And so uh, that's why the fellas, and if you read all the different accounts, uh, it was John and Peter. Peter was probably the oldest, maybe not close to it. Uh, some think Bartholomew was, was older. But John was definitely the youngest. And if you read the accounts, uh, when the women got back and told them that Jesus had risen, two of the men took off to go see for themselves. John and Peter. Then it says that Peter got to the door and stopped and didn't go in. And Peter, the old guy out of breath probably, finally caught up to him and pushed him aside and went on in and looked to see what had happened, and it talks about the cloth being folded up and so forth. This was a supernatural, once in forever experience when Jesus rose from the grave. Now, you might say along with me that, well, Brother David, there are several instances uh, where people rose from the dead. Jesus raise some people from the dead. The one we remember a lot around Easter is Lazarus because it was just before the trial and thing that he had raised Lazarus from the dead. But there were others that had been raised from the dead. Well, how is it that that is special? No one before had ever lived a sinless life. No one was ever worthy to be the once and for all sacrifice. Okay? You just think that uh, they said in Jerusalem that, uh, during Passover back then they did a mathematical formula and they said it would be about three and a half million people in Jerusalem. It was a real mess after that parade in. You know what I mean? because they tore down all those branches and thrown their cloaks out in the street for Jesus to come in the week before. And in less than five days, they were crying, crucify him. And he was crucified. And what they did to him, what they call the passion, it would kill most people. Uh, the way they beat him, and it wasn't a whipping, it was a beating. And they had something that, some think it was like the cat of nine tails, <clears throat> others think it was uh, something more. They do know that it had broken glass woven in the leather, and they had little flagella, which were little, uh, lead dumbbells that were woven in the end of it and uh, have you ever seen what a chainsaw will do to flesh it's not a pretty thing to see it's not and 
They didn't have a motor back then, but they would take that leather whip and they would whip the body and as those pieces of glass would dig in and those pieces of metal would whip around at the end, they would yank on it. And it was just like sawing meat with a chainsaw. Horrible, horrific. Anybody else would have died uh, from the beating, but Jesus was, a, even though he had to have somebody help him carry his cross, he was there. And we go through all the different things he said from the cross. Oh, it's exciting what he was doing for us. Now, when you get uh, adjudicated against sometime, uh, when you appear in front of a judge or a magistrate or something, you know, and they give the, the evidence against you, sometimes it's pretty hard, isn't it? You hear those things that you did, and maybe you're not guilty of all of them, but either way, it puts a weight on you. Jesus took the weight of all the sins in all the world, and he was innocent. And still he was able to cry out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Do we give people uh, that a break sometimes when they don't know the law? Yeah, we will. We, we are compassionate at times and we do that. A lot of times they won't do it in the court. They'll say ignorance of the law is no excuse. But they looked upon it, and Jesus had compassion upon the people. And at the end of it, before he gave up his last breath, um, he cried out, it is finished. It is finished. And when he says it is finished, there was a lot, thing, a lot of things that were finished. His earthly life encumbered by the body that passage was over paying the sacrifice the ransom for you and for me that was over having our sins forgiven that was done okay so Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost that was each one of us. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, uh, I don't know how we became anything else, but while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In just a moment, we're going to be coming to the table. And all who call on the name of the Lord are invited to come to the table, and we're going to symbolically be, take, be taken of the body and blood of Jesus Christ as we join our hearts and our hands together and we give glory to God. You know, let me see if I can do this and not mess it up. It says in the scripture, as often as you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death what? Until he comes again. Okay? Now, just think about it. I mean, you go to a ball game and you go in and you forget something's in the car and you go back out. Or well, when you come back to the gate, what? You have to prove evidence. Show your ticket, right? We have been given a permanent ticket. We proclaim the Lord's death. His death paid the price for us to get into heaven. So when we proclaim the Lord's death, that's what we're doing. Now that's just a thought of mine. Uh, remember I said about being a priesthood of uh, believers? You go back and you read that and see if you 
understand it that way. Let us pray. Father God, prepare our hearts and our minds as we get ready to come to the table. Forgive us of our many sins and help us, O oh Lord, to celebrate, to experience that means of grace of sharing at your table. It's in Christ Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Hi, I'm David Hoffman. If you've been tuned in with us today, we hope that you have enjoyed hearing God's word proclaimed. If you need to speak to me, uh, please don't hesitate to text me at 270-526-6027. Or you can email me at pastorhawker1996 at gmail.com. Again, that's pastorhawker1996 at gmail.com.